Hello, a warm welcome to you from SGT University. I am Dr. Atit Narayan from the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. Today, we will be learning about Gulen-Badi syndrome. These are the learning objectives of this lecture, which will include a brief introduction, epidemiology, immunopathogenesis, clinical features, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis of the patients who suffer from Gulen-Badi syndrome. Gulen-Badi syndrome is an acute, frequently severe, fulminant polyradiculoneuropathy that is autoimmune in nature. The prevalence of Gulen-Badi syndrome, according to a data published by World Health Organization, is 0.4 to 4 people per 1 lakh per year. Both males and females are affected, but males are at a higher risk than females. It affects population in all age groups, but adults are more frequently affected than children. Although order antigens have yet to be unequally identified, autoantibodies may bind to myelin antigens and this process leads to activation of complement. This is followed by formation of membrane attack complex on the outer surface of Schwann cells and the initiation of vesicular degeneration which leads to nerve injury. Macrophages subsequently invade myelin and acts as scavengers to remove myelin debris. Now let's discuss about the clinical features of Gulenbari syndrome. Gulenbari syndrome manifests as rapidly evolving a reflexic motor paralysis with or without sensory disturbance. The usual pattern is an ascending paralysis that may be first noticed as rubbery legs. Weakness typically progresses over a period of few hours to days and is frequently accompanied by tingling dysthesias in the extremities. The legs are usually more affected than the arms. Facial diaparesis is present in 50% of the affected individuals. Lower cranial nerves are frequently involved causing bulbar weakness with difficulty handling secretions and maintaining an airway. The diagnosis in these patients may initially be mistaken from brainstem ischemia. Pain in the shoulder, neck and back and diffusely over the spine is also common in the early stages of Gulenberry syndrome occurring in about 50% of the patients. Deep aching pain is also present in weakened muscles. These pains are self-limited and they respond to standard analgesics. Fever and constitutional symptoms are absent at the onset of the disease. Autonomic involvement is common and may occur even in patients whose GBS is otherwise mild. The usual manifestations are loss of vasomotor control with wide fluctuations in blood pressure, postural hypotension and cardiac dysrhythmias. These features require close monitoring and management as these features can be fatal. Bladder dysfunction is also present in severe cases but usually it is transient. On examination, deep tendon reflexes attenuate or disappear within first few days of onset of the disease. Proprioception is severely affected. Cutaneous sensory deficits like loss of pain and temperature sensation are relatively mild. Once clinical worsening stops and the patient reaches a plateau, which is almost always within 4 weeks of onset, further progression is unlikely. Acute infectious process, usually respiratory or gastrointestinal infections after a period of 1 to 3 weeks is the preceding event that leads to GBS in about 70% of the patients. Other infections or reinfections that can precipitate Gulenberry syndrome are Campylobacter jejuni, human herpes virus infection, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, HIV virus, 
hepatitis E virus and others. After learning about the clinical features, let's discuss about the diagnostic features of Guillain-Barré syndrome. The analysis of cerebrospinal fluid plays a very important role in diagnosing patients who are suffering from Guillain-Barré syndrome. Lumbar puncture is done for sampling of CSF. CSF findings in these patients will show albuminocytological dissociation, which means there will be an elevated CSF protein level in the range of 100 to 1000 mg per deciliter without any accompanying rise of cells. Transient increase in the CSF white cell count in the range of 10 to 100 per microliter can occasionally be seen in otherwise typical Guillain-Barré syndrome patients. Nerve conduction velocity examination of the affected nerves also plays a very important role in diagnosing the patients who are suffering from Guillain-Barré syndrome. The electrodiagnostic features are mild or absent in the early stages of Guillain-Barré syndrome and lags behind the clinical evolution. In acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which is the most common type of Guillain-Barré syndrome, the earliest features are prolonged F-wave latencies, prolonged distal latencies and reduced amplitude of compound muscle action potentials. Later, slowing of conduction velocity, conduction block and temporal dispersion may be appreciated. Finally, Let's discuss about the treatment options that can be offered to patients with Guillain-Barré syndrome. In the vast majority of patients with Guillain-Barré syndrome, treatment should be initiated as soon after diagnosis as possible. Each day counts. Two weeks after the first motor symptoms, it is not known whether immunotherapy is still effective. If the patient has already reached the plateau stage, then treatment probably is no longer indicated. Intravenous immunoglobulin, plasma pheresis, and supportive care are the mainstays of treatment for patients who are suffering from Guillain-Barré syndrome. Either high dose intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma pheresis can be initiated as they are equally effective for typical Guillain-Barré syndrome. Intravenous immunoglobulin is given in a usual dose of 2 gram per kg. It is administered over a period of 2 to 5 days. Improvement occurs in 70% of the patients either during treatment or within a week. The improvement continues for weeks to months. Plasma pheresis is also an equally effective modality of treatment for patients who are suffering from Guillain-Barré syndrome. A course of 4 to 5 exchanges, each exchange consisting of 40 to 50 ml per kg of plasma is administered over a period of 7 to 10 days. Finally, let's discuss about the prognosis and recovery of patients who are suffering from Guillain-Barré syndrome. Full functional recovery occurs within a year in about 85% of the patients. Mortality rate is less than 5% in optimal settings. Death usually results from secondary pulmonary complications. Worst prognosis of the disease is seen in patients who are suffering from severe proximal motor and sensory axonal type of neuropathy. 5-10% to of the patients with typical GBS have one or more late relapses and they are identified as chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So today we covered Guillain-Barré syndrome and the next time we meet we will be learning about alcoholic liver disease. Till then. Keep learning, keep growing, see you next time.